Hey, good morning. Welcome to um, our last science seminar for the semester. We're going to be talking about things that students like, sugar and gum. Yeah. And it's good to meet our, our speaker this morning. He, um, he's from South Dakota in some parts there, most recently. And I grew up out that direction up in Iowa, so that was fun to talk about. He got his bachelor's degree um, from Purdue in biological sciences. He got a master's degree from Texas A&M. So he came down to the south as soon as he could there. And he got a master's degree in biochemistry. And he continued that and got a, a PhD in biochemistry from Texas A&M. Then he was, um, did some work at Michigan State University as a microbiologist and at the University of Arizona as a molecular microbiologist. So he'll have to tell you what the difference there between <coughs> molecular microbiologist is. And he did a postdoc at Boston College in chemistry. And he's had several positions in academics as an associate professor at the University of Southern Mississippi. He's been at the South Dakota State University for a good, good while there. And now, um, just recently, he's moved down to Commerce, where he's the head of the Department of Chemistry at the University of Texas in Commerce. Have you ever been to Commerce? No? A couple people have? Yep. All right. Nice place to visit. Okay. You're on your way to Dallas or something, taking the north route, you stop off in Commerce there. So he's going to talk to us today about um, polysaccharides and gum. And I would like to also invite all of you to join us for lunch at the um, Joyce Room of the Corner Cafe. So if you'd like to learn more about the University of Texas at Commerce, or more about South Dakota, or anything like that, or just what life is like for somebody who's a scientist working on um, gum and sugars and stuff, please join us for lunch. This will be the last time you can this semester, right? And then you got to go the whole summer Fasting, right? There'll be no science seminars for a whole summer. Yes? And um, so you should store up on all your science seminar memories that you can now so that you can live off of them over the summer. All right? All right, let's um, welcome our speaker. Thank you, Dr. DeBoer, for the invitation to do the seminar here. Most of the work. I'm going to present to you. I've only been in commerce eight months, so I've got research program started, but not producing uh, a lot of results yet. <coughs> so what I'm going to talk about today is really an overview of the research, looking at production of like specialty chemicals and microbial gums from like biomass grasses, uh, co-products from like biodiesel production ethanol production. Since I was up in the Midwest, then, you know, ethanol, especially in South Dakota, is big. You have Poet, it's a big ethanol producer up there. And so a lot of it is figuring out what do you do with the byproducts. I mean, it's uh, changed a little with gas prices as they continue to go down, then people care less again. It's always with looking for new uses for byproducts. It's sort of when gas prices are up, everybody's interested, and when they go down, then they're not so interested. So what I'm going to talk about is just production of chemicals and polysaccharides. <coughs> this is just, it seemed like most people hadn't been to Commerce. This is our building in McFarland Science Center, so it's 10 years old, still relatively new. Chemistry's on the third floor. So this is what I'm going to cover as far as specialty chemicals, citric acid, 3-hydroxypropanaldehyde, malic acid, fumaric acid, xylitol, then gum production from biomass, puyolin, and curdlin. So if you look at citric acid is, you know, if you look at most foods, you'll see citric acid in it. It's an acidulant. 
you start to see like xylitol is in like orbit gum because it doesn't cause cavities. If you put sucrose or glucose, then you get you know rotting in your teeth. So xylitol with doesn't cause so it's doesn't cause cavities, so it reduces trips to the dentist. Malic acid, fumaric acid are more used as sort of substitutes for citric. 3-hydroxypropionaldehyde is goes on to be used for plastic production. So just again the chemicals. So we'll start with citric acids. So you can see with citric acid, you've got beverages, it's used in 45%, a lot of foods. Confectionaries use 21%. You can see why. If you take off the protons, you know, it's a good chelating agent. I mean, over here, if you take that off, metal ions can bind to it. So citric acid is put in to hold things together. All right, so you've got your food. If you don't put citric acid, you get layering out. People don't want to see that. They would figure something's wrong with their food. You know, if it all separated on its own, so they put citric acid in to hold it together and make sure the metal ions don't precipitate out that are in the mixture. <clears throat> Detergents, cleaning industry, 19%. Again, it's a chelating agent. Pharmaceutical industry, you see a lot of drugs with... <clears throat> Citrate at the, you know, whatever the drug is, citrate. So it's used there to hold it in. <clears throat> so about 900,000 tons of citric acid produced per year, with most of it being produced by Aspergillus niger fermentation. <clears throat> so this work was done in South Dakota State. So you can see a former PhD worked on this and was looking at <coughs> grains. So corn distillage grains comes from when you do ethanol production. That's what's the residual part of it. You know, you get ethanol, comes off. <coughs> the grains are left behind. And so what else can you do with it? You can feed it to animals or you can convert it to other things. It still has starch in it. So you can see here, untreated versus autoc autoclave. <clears throat> so each one of these ATCC numbers is a different fungus. It's an Aspergillus niger fungus. So you can see different results that autoclaving, you know, just sterilizing it doesn't make it a better substrate. It goes over here and then my grad student used that strain and then was able to do more studies with that. I actually published another paper out of that. But what it showed is you can use the grains to produce the citric acid. <coughs> the alternative way is to use yeast, which is Canada. So there's a lot of different Canada species you can grow on. Crude glycerol. So with biodiesel, the way you make biodiesel, you take oil, sodium hydroxide, heat, and methanol. <clears throat> so you end up with biodiesel, usually some fatty acids, a lot of crude glycerol, so it's like 70% glycerol, but it still has some fatty acids in it. So the current price of crude glycerol is like a nickel a gallon, <clears throat> so not many uses for it. So if you can find more uses for it, then it'll make support biodiesel processing, make it more favorable economically. So there's a lot of research looking at like crude glycerol now. I think that's in the next slide. So you can see what you know the crude glycerol looks like. So it's really brown looking. It's got high pH because you get sodium hydroxide in there. <clears throat> Usually if you let this sit for a while, you start to get fatty acids around the side. So if you go to, like, if they produce biodiesel, they'll give tons of this if you want to take it away. 
because otherwise you can't dump it anywhere. You know, EPA is not going to allow it, so you have to dispose of it. So if you find other uses for it, you know, then it would increase value. And it would be another industry, like a side industry for biodiesel production. <clears throat> what you can see here is just over time, you see, with these are all different Canada strains. So you can see up there, you know, they're not all the same. <clears throat> Just testing over time with different concentrations. We get 1% and 6%. Obviously, in most cases, you can see 6% is higher. So the big problem with crude glycerol is how much can you really put in there? Because you know any organism can only take so much glycerol, and so you have to find a happy medium so you can grow it on it. <clears throat> So you can see some of the strains down here, like Tropicalis and Gosa. Catanolata, they don't do as well as Guiamundi and Parapolopsis. Uh, another thing we've been looking at is, you know, could you isolate? We knew that from the previous slide that Canada Guiamundi was able to grow on glycerol. So the next thing we want to check, could you make it do more than one thing? So a lot of times in my lab we look at mutant strains. You know, can you isolate a mutant? So in this case we're looking at lysine and citric acid overproduction. And lysine overproduction, you can usually do that with, there's chemical analogs, you can add to medium. If the organism grows on it, then it's resistant. You can screen it for how much lysine it produces. And so that's what you're seeing here. <clears throat> so you can see we got a mutant here. <clears throat> and the parent string, 9058. And what we were looking at was we want to see if we could produce lysine using glucose as a carbon source, and then citric acid on glycerol. So it's just by changing the medium, you could have an overproducer that went either way. <clears throat> and what you're seeing here is you know, we have on glucose, you can see it's much larger than the parent. You know, it's like at least five-fold higher. The mutant, not so much. It's a little bit higher, but not much of a change there. So on this one, you can see this is just biomass. How much do they produce under the different circumstances? This is how much cells do they produce? Because usually you want to figure out how much cell dry weight, and that gives you indication how much product's going to be produced. Then you see here, you know, on glycerol, you have higher amounts than with glucose. And this is with citric acid production. So the parent strain still produces a low amount, but the mutant strain produces you know, at least you know, about sevenfold higher. So it shows you, you could use this for then for biodiesel, you could use it for crude glycerol, you could switch it back to use it in regular meat and produce lysine. So it's ways to think about, you know, how many different products can you produce at any given time. So up there is 3-hydroxypropanaldehyde. <coughs> So if you know anything about like E. Like coli and some of the enteric bacteria, they can produce 3-hydroxypropanaldehyde enzymatically from glycerol. So 3-hydroxypropanaldehyde is a precursor of acrolein. So acrolein is used in plastic production, food preservation, and tissue fixative. 
So we were investigating 3-hydroxypropanolide production by bacterium Citrobacter frundi. So the advantage of that particular organism is that it is not pathogenic. Most of the organisms that you could produce, 3-hydroxypropanolide would be like Klebsiella and Enterobacter, which, you know, is more pathogenic, they're less safe. This has the lowest biosafety rating. So again, we're looking at soy-based crude glycerol. And this was part of a bigger project, a U.S. Department of Agriculture product. We were looking at one part was bacteria. The other part was looking at yeast production of citric acid, just to see if you could do it. So we are able to isolate a mutant strain that exhibited elevated aldehyde production compared to the parent strain. So we had to devise a technique so we could detect a mutant. And a lot of that was, you know, put on a plate, make replica plates, and then pour a compound over it. And what it was, it turned red, and we could tell which ones were mutants. Because otherwise it's brute force, which means you just keep doing it. You put everybody on it and try to figure out how can you overproduce? So you can see 3 hydroxypropanaldehyde. So you can see grams per liter. You can see crude glycerol coming across. And with the crude glycerol, the higher you go, it starts going up here. But in general, you know, you reach a limited concentration somewhere between 1 and 2 percent. And so. It appears to be the optimum as far as you get too high and it just shuts down. There's too much glycerol. And that's not unusual. You'd have to use usually a recombinant DNA organism that would have to ha have genes for high metabolism of glycerol to overcome that. But we're able to show you could produce 3 hydroxypropanaldehyde. <clears throat> this is just cell weight. So they're all. Relatively speaking, it's really not based on that. You can see from 1 to 2 percent, they're about the same. There's no change there. And there's actually more biomass, more cells being produced the longer you go. So it tells you that they can still grow on it, but they stop producing the 3 hydroxypropanaldehyde. A lot of times it's just, it may mean that glycerol is being funneled into some growth pathway to turn it on. Further growth. Switching to malic acid production, you can see malic acid. If you had any biochemistry, you know, you've seen citric before, you've seen malic before, you've seen fumaric. You know, it's just all members of the cycle. So you can see here malic acid. <coughs> We're looking here on, again, using fungal species. Aspergillus is a fungus. And we're growing on thin stillage. So when they produce ethanol, they remove the grains. You end up with a syrup. And what they try to do is they just collect it in bottles. And, I mean, if you've heard of distillers' grains with solubles, they'll take the wet syrup, dry it down, add it to the grains, mix it up, and then that's a way to get rid of it, because otherwise it's a low value resource. It does have a lot of yeast in it, so it has a lot of vitamins in it, but limited use there. So we're looking at it, could you use thin stillage to produce malic acid? Because there have been studies out there that, you know, from the 1970s, that, you know, you could do this. And so what we did here was just, you know, these are just different strains of Aspergillus niger. So you can see, you, know, you get some that produce more than others. And you can see it's 192 hours, so you have to wait quite a while. 200 RPMs, it's usually in a shaker. You'll see one later. This is another one. Instead of using thin stillage, we used uh, crude glycerol. And you can see here that it was able to produce it with the different strains of 
three of the Aspergillus niger strains. And so what you're seeing here is malic acid for black bars, vinyl mass, and white bars. So it's low. Doesn't necessarily grow a lot, but it does produce a lot of acid. <coughs> and so when we're looking at these strains, it just means <coughs> similar to citric acid production, if you get an aspergillus that overproduces citric acid, that just means that, you know, for some reason the citric acid cycle is turned on and it produces too much, so it's excreted <coughs> out of the cell. Same thing with malic acid. You'll find that with certain strains, and that's what you're seeing here when you test it. So the big thing was to find out, you know, could you produce malic acid? Because that would be, that's a value as well. So malic acid is more value than crude glycerol or from uh, thin stillage. Fumaric, so moving along within the citric acid cycle. So fumaric acid is produced by a different fungus, Rhizopus or rhizi. We did solid state fermentation. And what that means is you put, in this case, it was the grains, solid material, and you just dump, basically you inoculate the outside and the fungus will grow on the solid material for usually about 10 days <clears throat> and then produces the acid. And so that's all solid state fermentation. If it's liquid or batch fermentation, that means you do it in a shaker or a culture. So there's more work on that. Rhizopus or rhizi is not the greatest organism to deal with, but it's just, it's a lot worse than dealing with Aspergillus niger. None of the funguses are pleasant, but Rhizopus, I think, can have, it gives off a lot of spores, so you have to watch what you're breathing with it. So the applications for fumaric can be polyester, aspartate, Manufacturing, all the acids are good for being an acidulant. That just means lower the pH, keep it low. Printing inks and psoriasis treatment. So fumaric has use there. And this is just some of the research that was done with, there were only three strains that we could find that were producing fumaric acid. And so this is all grains, and so you have different types of treatment. None would be untreated. Autoclave <coughs> would be just, we stick it in autoclave, sterilize it. The other ones were autoclave, but in the presence of a half percent sulfuric, or one percent, one and a half, or two percent. So you have to keep the concentrations low, because otherwise it produces inhibitors that stop you know, growth of either bacteria or fungi. So what you can see here is that the best producer was 52918. And it's 1% sulfuric. As you increased it, it dropped off. You see some of the results, it drops off here. Not so much with head 260. So you can produce fumaric acid from you know, just biomass that has lower value, because most of the chemicals are all going to be more expensive than the biomass. Switching away from the organic acids, we're looking at xylitol production. And so in this case, we're looking at, this is a big blue stems, basically a weed that grows, a wild you know, grass that grows in the northern plains. I think it comes all the way down to Texas. And what we were doing here was there was a big push to see, can you take grasses and convert them to something more valuable? You know, can you bioconvert it? So in this case, we're looking at xylitol, just uh, artificial sweetener. So you can see it up here. It's supposed to have, so any karyogenic just means it doesn't cause cavities, prevents ear infections, they'll put xylitol in. It's supposed to be able to be used for biotechnology, for stimulating uh, you know, a cell line, 
hybridoma cell line and production. So what you see here, we collect the grass, grind it up, and usually treat it. So you can treat it with acid to break it down more, or you can treat it with alkaline peroxide, where it's, you've got base in there, plus hydrogen peroxide to see if you can break it down. <clears throat> so what you can see up here, there's a lot of different, you got all these different Canada species that we tested. And so we grew them on this prairie prairie grass hydrolysate, and you'll see another one we'll talk about in a few minutes, a different grass. Because the big question is, I mean, a lot of these grasses grow really tall, so you have good production. So if we're ever going to switch away from petroleum, if you're going to use grasses, because you have some in Florida where, uh, you know, they're using some variants of sugar cane where they'll grow really high and you can break it down and you get you produce different chemicals that way. Because what they're trying to do, the goal with all this is produce biorefineries, right? Where you're producing, you take some type of biomass, you convert it to a higher value. Because if gas prices, petroleum prices go back up, all these compounds come from petroleum. That means they're going to get more expensive. So until the biggest problem now is that, you know, they keep dropping down as the Saudis keep flooding the market with oil. But eventually, you know, the oil will run out, and you're going to have to figure out different ways to get your chemicals. Otherwise, you're going to pay big money for, you know, because now, when you look at the gas industry, the petroleum industry, they make certainly as much money off the chemicals they produce as they do in the gasoline. And that's a big part, because they looked at it as soon as they went into, you know, cracking the petroleum, the oil that came out, and they started getting different you know, cyclic compounds that they found they could convert to you know, different chemical intermediates that were important for like plastic production and things like that. So they've been doing it for a long time. The bio end of it hasn't been done that long. It's been more recent. It's only really you know, since gas prices went up. Because you get spurts in the 1980s when you had the oil embargo, and that's where ethanol production came out. Everything, all the prices shot up. There were lines, people were waiting to get gas. They can only go alternate days and all this. And so that's where ethanol production came out. In the Midwest, they started working on that as a possible, you know, what's the cheapest fuel you could use and put it in gasoline, and ethanol is. Now they're working on like butanol, higher amounts you could put in to get more energy out of it. You know, there's a lot of companies in the Midwest doing that. But at the same time, I mean, then after that, gas prices went down, and the research on bio-based production drops off, and then as gas prices go back up, then there's more interest again. So you get a variability. Now with gas, petroleum prices down, then... I don't know if there's as much emphasis on this, but it'll, sooner or later it'll come back up. What you can see here is that all the strains can produce xylitol. You know, it didn't really make much difference. They're all capable of producing it, and you just assay for the amount of xylitol. There's an enzyme you can use to just test it, how much xylitol you have in there. Because that's with most of these, when you're testing it, you know, there's an enzyme assay you do in a spectrophotometer. And you can see the change over time, and that's what you're seeing here. It just indicates that, you know, it's relatively easy for the Canada strains that were chosen to produce xylitone. We switch from chemicals, so xylitone was the last chemical, to two gums. I've worked on more than two, but the only two I've worked on in my lab with looking at you know, where it's biomass based or bio based would be Puyolan and Curdlan. So you can see Puyolan up here. You can see it's long. You know, you got multiple trios. You got three glucoses together. So it's roughly about 95% multiple trios. You've got maybe 5% multiple tetros. And that's the way it's a long chain. And 
And as far as a gum, it's not like, if you think of gums, you probably look at your food and you see xanthan gum. Xanthan gum is a really thick gum. And so when it goes in, that's the whole point, to make it as thick as possible. Like xanthan can go down, they use that for oil, secondary oil recovery. So it's so thick, you know, you can put it down the well and it'll displace the oil. Puyallan's the opposite end of the spectrum. You know, it's a very light gum. And you can see, you'll see what its use is in a minute. And so it's water soluble. So you can put it in different products. So as soon as it hits water, it dissolves. Curdlan is different, is that it's alkali soluble. So you actually have to derive this when you're producing it. It's like puyolan is produced, I should say, it's by a fungus, oribicity and puyolans. So it just secretes it outside into the medium, so it's not hard you know, to see it. You just take some of the medium, add it to ethanol, and it precipitates out. So it's not hard. That means you can dry it and you can weigh it. So you can do gravimetric results. So the fungus is just usually, it's, a, it's called a black yeast, or you be in puyolan, so you end up with usually kind of greenish looking cultures but you know it secretes it in there it's not really clear it's probably in the wild it probably secretes it so it can stick to plants because Oribicidium puyolan is the one they test for army boots to see how long they last because it has so many enzymes it can degrade army boots so you'll find it in, certainly in jungles Things like that. I know there are scientists work in Thailand, so it's not hard for them to find, you know, strains that they've isolated. They can find it anywhere, and they all produce a lot of different enzymes. It's almost like a little machine, and so they use the gum to stick, and then they start secreting enzymes to start attacking the plant, so they can digest it. Curdlan, on the other hand, the alkali soluble is produced by Agrobacterium. So it's a bacterial uh, strain. So you can see it's ATCC 31749. And then it's another simple one. It's just a long chain of glucose. So with puyolan, as I said, it's synthesized by the fungus Oribicidae and puyolan. So it's extracellular. It doesn't have any charge on it. If you look at xanthan that they put in your food, you know, that has charge. So it can interact with metal ions that are also in the food to make it thicker. <coughs> it's water soluble, insoluble in alcohol, and you can see the molecular weight range is you know, pretty wide depending on the strain. <coughs> Japanese, you can get a free sample from, I don't know if they'll still send it. But a Japanese company that produced it you know, sent a free, couple of free bags of this. You know, it's pretty much the lowest grade they could send, but it looks nice and white anyway. This was processed. You can see what they use it for films for coating or packaging, textile sizing agent, colorless adhesive, blood plasma substitute. It's like dextran. You can use that to dilute blood because there's no charge. <coughs> So Puyolan's the same way. Vaccines, no charge. Flocculating agent, Nalco in Chicago uses it instead of, uh, instead of polyacrylamide for water purification, particularly in Europe, because Europeans are more worried about you know, breakdown products of polyacrylamide. Additives to foods and beverages, more of a light, viscous material. You got cyanoethylpuyolan, dielectric material. With cosmetics, it's just if you derivatize it, you can use it for shampoos, things like that. Binder for foundry sands. A lot of the gums, they'll add this to the cement, and it prevents cracking, so it takes you know, more stretchability, I guess. And photographic emulsions, there's patents that exist on how the Japanese have that as well. <coughs> So where is Puyolan used in? So if you've ever seen pocket packs, 
at the store, read what the first ingredient is. So if you don't like putting fungus in your mouth, it just tells you you don't know what you're eating. Because it's definitely in there. Because I was actually out before they launched the pocket packs out to New Jersey. And I've been working on Puyland for quite a while before that, so they brought me in. I think they thought I was going to produce Puyland, but I said I didn't have facilities to do that. And they're actually testing it because you, you can see how it all works out. You have chemical engineers and everybody trying to figure out what the formulation should be. So by the time I went there, it's like Morris Plains, New Jersey. So it was, <clears throat> it's now it's bought by Pfizer, but they're the big ones on... If you go to the labs, all you see is Listerine everywhere. This is Warner Lambert Labs, and they're the ones that make Listerine. And that's what they were talking about. Maybe they could stick Puyolan into Listerine, and so when you gargled your mouth, maybe you know, it would stick to your teeth, prevent cavities or something. I haven't seen anything relative to that. But you, if you look at the stores, you've got the, the old like green ones, you got red ones, a lot of different types that usually it's around as you check me out. The other one they do use Puyolan and whitening strips, so they are using it for that. In their formulation. So you can see up there, as far as strains go, the one that's on the right hand side is what that's the way the fungus normally looks. It's actually dark green, but it looks black. As the longer it sits, it gets darker and darker. Produces a lot of melanin pigment. So we were able to isolate one that didn't produce it. So it's just RP1, reduced pigmentation one. And so sent that to American Type Culture Collection. So it got its own number, 211253. So you can see, you know, and this was part of a paper. We're just looking at different carbon sources. What you take away from it is that you end up with less melanin. I mean, you can look at it and pretty much see the same thing. We're looking at this for, you know, try to do straight improvement. Is, uh, is melanin harmful? No, I mean, I think we got melanin as our skin pigmentation. It's right. just how much you have. So, I mean, you can see here, these are like Oribasidium cultures. It looks pretty dark. So a lot of this stuff is just shaking. You said so many RPMs. And this is what, so put you in on a glass rod. So it's sort of like with organic chemistry when you do the, the nylon experiment, is you can swirl it around. If you take culture medium that the fungus produces, you add ethanol to it and you start swirling it, you end up with a blob of the polysaccharide precipitates out. You can see it's you know nice white feature depending which strain you use. If you use the pigment, pigmented one, then you end up with a grayer version. And so it's just, then the Japanese company, what they do with this, they'll take it, dry it out, grind it up, and usually go through diatomaceous earth to take the pigment out. And then they sell that package you saw, the white package, that's how they produce it. This is just more different strains we've isolated over time. So you can see here, this is the wild type strain we're using. We're able to use both of these produce more puyolan in a shorter period of time. You could make fast producers. And so you can produce more gum. You know, as you can see with 42023, it sort of levels off. The other two keep going. They reach after about 72 hours, they reach a maximum there. So. Just other strains that you could use. We also did cell immobilization. So this was from a grant. So I wrote a grant just to see, I don't know, if it would be funded or not. What I proposed was looking at adsorption versus entrapment. So adsorption is where it just sticks to the outside of a material. Entrapment is actually in beads. Like, have you ever seen calcium alginate beads? Or you can use sponge. 
there was these sponge cubes over here. We had an undergraduate that was cutting those up. So you can see a lot of work went into that, get those little uniform cubes out of it. And it actually works that you because the fungus will grow on the outside as well go with, as well as go in the spore in the pores of the cubes. The other ones over here are like alginate. So there's calcium alginate. You can entrap the fungal cells within it. <clears throat> the big question here is that if it's producing a high molecular weight, then it shouldn't be able to use entrapped cells, if you think about it, because how would it get out of you know, the matrix surrounding it? But it actually did. We could see with certain ones, like chitosan, when we did that, it blew up the beads. You'd watch them pop. So it was interesting, but not really useful. But, you know, calcium alginate worked. We could actually take the beads and bounce them off the floor. So they had enough. If they're 3 or 4%, and they, you know, calcium alginate, they're pretty sturdy. So we did a lot of work on there just to see if it could be done. So depending on, you know, which ones you use, it will work. Back to grasses. So in the Midwest, again, the prairie cordgrass is another big grass just growing out in fields. So up there they have a lot of CRP land. And so what the grasses have to be harvested at different times. So you can see cellulose, about 3, 33%. Xylose and arabinose. So it's, xylose would indicate how much hemicellulose is there. And lignin, 21%. Lignin is what gives it its support. So this one is just some of the data that we haven't published yet. So what you can see is this is when you hydrolyze, this is what, when we measure it using HPLC, what was in the hydrolysate. Is at 1.1% glucose, 0.7% xylose, 0.2% arabinose. You can see this is with no additive, just buffered hydrolysate. It's just about the same. If we had magnesium sulfate, it increases a little bit higher. Same thing with sodium chloride. So it indicates you don't have to have a complete medium. You could grow it off the grass. If you look at yield gram per gram, you can see it's actually better for if you add magnesium sulfate and sodium chloride. Yields aren't so great for just the hydrolysate and what is in the hydrolysate. Another thing that's important with poulin, just because you produce the gum doesn't mean it's poulin. So the fungus will produce, depending on circumstance, what it's growing on, you'll have different content. And so sometimes you'll have, like, there's an enzyme, poulinase, that exists. That's produced, like, by Klebsiella that'll break it down. You can use it to measure what your content is. So what you're seeing here is that usually with glucose, you end up with about 70 to 80 percent poulin. So what also indicates you don't have 100% authentic poulin with any of these. The hydrolysate is much lower. You get down around 42%. You can see the addition of magnesium sulfate or sodium chloride. Looks like magnesium sulfate is probably about equal. You know, it would be acceptable as far as 80% because you want to have a higher percentage when you're using it like for gum production as far as you know, what Warner Lambert or Pfizer is using with uh, pocket packs, they want to make sure they have a consistent. So you can see here you can do that. So it's just add magnesium sulfate to a buffered medium with the hydrolysate in it. The other gum is curd land. So curd land, this is what it looks like when you precipitate it out. Curd land is actually a capsule. <coughs> capsule around a bacterium, and so when you add sodium hydroxide, the capsule dissolves, goes into sodium hydroxide, then you add HCl, 
it's insoluble in water or HCl, so it precipitates out, and this is what it looks like, a waxy material. And there's been, you know, it's insoluble, it's soluble in alcohol, but not in water. So the agrobacterium species ATCC31749 is used. It used to be used where there was a company around New York that used it, but I don't know if they went out of business or what. You got... You know, it's going to be, uh, it's a thicker one, so it's going to improve food. So you've got adhesion in foods, uh, marketed as pure glucan. There's a company in San Diego that's using it for pharmaceutical uses, just in with theirs. So it can be used as a textural agent and, you know, just cons consistency in meat, dairy, baking, and pharmaceutical products. So there's a lot of different uses. So with this, we were looking at, since all gums are based upon, you know, UDP glucose produces all these gums, so this just shows you, and so I've worked on a lot in primitive metabolism, you can see here, it's just different components, uracil, cytosine is converted to uracil, the thymine, the uracil, erotic acid is part of a primitive biosynthetic pathway. What we're looking at is, if you added uracil, would you end up with more curd land than you would without it? You can see that occurs when it's higher. Cytosine, you know, the uh, bacterium contains cytosine deaminase, which converts it to uracil. That's why this is just as high. You don't really see an effect there. So it indicates it's dependent on upon you know, what the uracil concentration is to make UDP glucose. But it's the same thing for curd land, land. Uh, xanthan, they're all based upon that. So this is just more warp mutant work. So you can see the parent strain, the mutant strain. You can see on glucose, it's at least 1.6 fold higher. It's almost two fold on corn syrup. And we're looking at this as part of a grant. Let's see if we could isolate mutants. This is what we're working on more, well, just before I left South Dakota State, again, off a of grant. And so curd land concentrations produced by that prairie cord grass hydrolysates where we break it down and see, you know, because we're using, like, cellulase to break it down. We'd autoclave it, hit it with uh, cellulase, which lets the cellulose break down the glucose. And what these indicate is to the medium, we would add so much ammonium, ammonium phosphate. So with all of these, they're all dependent on nitrogen concentration. Because usually when you produce a gum, you have to limit it. So what you're going to see here with 31749, the optimum was around 2.2 millimolar. So you can see you know, you got 96 is the white, 120 gray, 144 is black. So this is just the wild type strain. This is the yield in the wild type strain, still 2.2 millimolar. So that's just the optimums to start producing the gum. If you put too much nitrogen, it goes towards growth. And this is what the mutant we isolated. So you can see it changes from with 31749. This was the optimum. Now with the mutant, it goes up. So it may indicate it takes more nitrogen. Maybe it's producing it faster, so it may require more nitrogen. You can see 3.3. Same thing. Yield. So you can see here it's again 3.3. So you can produce with both of these what it says is both Puyalan and Curdlan can be produced from hydrolyzed biomass. It's just possible to do it. So, conclusions. So, you know, recent research lab shows that you can produce specialty chemicals or gums from plant biomass. Use of mutant strains you know, helps with the bioconversion. You can use relatively low value co-products from other production processes from 
coin-based ethanol production or biodiesel production. And we're able to use cell mobilization studies relative to quinoline production, showing that you could actually immobilize cells, absorption and entrapment. And you see, I've been around for a while, so I've got a lot of people to thank. And we've got students over time, uh, technical support. So usually if you get a grant, then you can support technician, you know, different funding agencies. Give you a quick overview of who's in the chemistry department at Texas A&M Commerce. So we've got, so I'm the biochemist. We've got Dr. Angels, analytical chemist. Alan Headley is organic chemist. Ben Jang, physical chemist. Buko Ni is inorganic chemist. Steven Sarge is bioinorganic. <coughs> and we have some instructional faculty, staff. We, Right now I have 20 grad students, and so we have roughly about 25 thesis students. If you're interested, you can see the different areas. You can see they do presentations. You know, everybody has to do a poster at some point. And you can see McFarland at night. So I'll stop there and entertain any questions. I think we have time for one question or so. Questions from the audience? Tell me you have in your pocket. Great, please. Sure, man. <laughs> the polyland and the curuland are both not toxic. You use them widely, it looks like. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, they're used commercially. I mean, it's just like Xanthem isn't. I mean, it has to prove, be approved to FDA before they can use, use it for foods. So most gums, anything you see, you know, it's, it's gone through, you know, I mean, they've done toxicology studies on Puyolan, it was, you know, the only way you could kill a rat with that if you gave them, you know, like a couple of kilograms, made them eat it, <laughs> when it's toxic. Okay, um, we're going to be going for lunch, so if you'd like to join us, we do. I want to thank our... Um Thank you, Dr. West, for coming today. Yep. Oh. <laughs>